Hello everyone, my name is Peter Zaitsev and I'm CEO of uh, Percona and I'm going to talk to you about uh, avoiding open source, in quotes, uh, traps. But before we mm, get to that, I wanted to talk about uh, how did we get uh, here and uh, what is that uh, open source, mm, in uh, quotes, is and how is it different from their open source proper. Now, in the very early days, hardware and uh, software were uh, bundled, right, for uh, all kind of uh, different reasons. And uh, the source code was uh, shipped uh, with that uh, early uh, software which was uh, distributed because that software could uh, run only with uh, uh, hardware, right? It was, you know, very uh, proper hardware at that time. There was really little point in, uh, in, uh, in uh, hiding the source code, while sharing source code allowed the early adopters of those software and hardware systems to modify the code, to fix bugs, add functionality they need, and so on and so forth. And also because the early adopters, a lot of them, their, their uh, universities, uh, software was really shared according to academic principles of sharing knowledge, which for centuries was actually very similar to what the open source is for, um, for software. Now, uh, in the 70s, uh, we have uh, the first uh, software unbundling uh, taking place, right? In some sources, uh, that is an IBM. In others, it was due to the pressures of uh, uh, AT&T and a breakdown. But the point uh, is uh, what the hardware and the software was uh, uh, unbundled as one important change. And the other is software became a copyrightable item, in US at least, right? And it's maybe hard to believe now, but before that, computer software was not really something what you could, uh, could copyright, right? It was not on the list of uh, uh, copyrightable things. The first two events, the multi-billion dollar software industry mm, was created, and the proprietary software has become the major class of uh, uh, intellectual uh, property, right? And I would say software as a whole uh, pivoted to more proprietary software. In the 80s and 90s, we have an era of uh, romantic open source software and uh, free software, right? Uh, Richard Stallman displayed on this picture preferred mm, the mm, free software and uh, uh, free software foundation was uh, I would say the early uh, champions in this space. The open source initiative started a little bit uh, later, when you can, uh, in uh, February 1999, by Bruce Perens and um, Eric uh, Raymond, which you can see on, uh, on these pictures. Another great illustration of that uh, era for me, at least, is uh, uh, described by those uh, few words uh, from Linus Torvalds, creator of uh, Linux, of course, uh, where when he was talking about how he came to create Linux, so he told that, that was just for fun. I think that is a very important to know what uh, in, uh, in those years, uh, the majority of the open source movement was created by people who really mm, did it for uh, fun, right, or for uh, their uh, values, not particularly as a way to uh, make uh, the money, retire young, retire rich, buy a yacht, and so on and so forth. Now, this is also in the end of 90s, as when I got first uh, involved with uh, open source. I was both uh, studying in the university, in the Moscow State University, when you, you were exposed to a, a lot of uh, early days open source, such as Linux operating system, uh, Apache, and uh, a few others, uh, as well as uh, I had my own uh, startup, 
called uh, SpyLog at that time, which was uh, built on the open source software. And uh, it could not have existed without open source software at that time because really we did not uh, have any uh, money to buy a uh, licensed software as an Oracle and we need a database, right? Or some sort of proprietary operating system as Solaris or uh, Windows. Well, uh, uh, Actually, we could because that was Russia, and uh, in Russia you could buy any software for just you know a couple of dollars on um, a CD, a CD, but that wouldn't uh, be very uh, legal, of course. Now, if you look at open source software, it of course provides a lot of values for developers, which are not related to its cost. Like for example, open source allows you to understand software uh, much better because you have access to its uh, source code. This is, for example, very important for us uh, at Percona. We never could uh, uh, support uh, the proprietary database like Oracle when the same quality as we can do for MySQL, uh, Postgres, or MongoDB because we don't have an access to resource code and just access to binary makes it very hard to figure things out. Open source also allows collaboration with other developers, which is often very exciting and valuable for uh, developers which are passionate about the code, right? You can actually look at the code and uh, provide improvements, not just ideas, right? Or bug reports as you could with uh, proprietary software. That also increases the speed of innovation because frankly, if you're not happy with how quickly open source projects uh, innovates and moves, you can always uh, to contribute yourself and get things you need uh, faster. And finally, open source project gives you their uh, fantastic uh, community, right? I think uh, the open source uh, communities that tend to be much more uh, supportive, uh, friendly, and larger than communities for uh, a lot of uh, open source or the proprietary software. If you look is uh, in 2000s, that is the era where the open source becomes much more mainstream. And in fact, it gets kind of its uh, of its, uh, ups, uh, ups and downs, right? Uh, the uh, Linux was, uh, recognized as a great enemy of a Microsoft at that time. I mean, we all know those days Microsoft is all about open source, of course, but that was not the, uh, the uh, case in early 2000s. And uh, Steve Ballmer would compare Linux to cancer. And also that is where we had some uh, uh, great uh, uh, successes. In uh, mid to late 2000s, uh, the MySQL was acquired what looked like a huge valuation of billion dollars at that time. Now we have a number of open source companies which are uh, pushing or exceeding $10 million in uh, valuation. But at that time, that was a huge vote of confidence for uh, open source. With that, in the same time, we have seen what the value of the open source was understood by business. A number of companies have been embracing the open source first approach, right? Where uh, they would see open source as a, a strategic uh, initiative, very critically important for their company to, uh, to be successful. Now, what is interesting, if you look at the open source from business, you can see a lot of values which relate to their lower cost, first and foremost, short term, long term, as well as reducing, uh, reducing risk of potentially higher cost. Now, first is, of course, directly lower cost. If you look at uh, even uh, looking at commercially supported open source software, it is typically cost less than proprietary. Engineers also uh, likes uh, open source, right? And there are uh, often more open source, familiar with open source software, especially those days, which uh, reduces costs. 
in a certain extent, you also get a better productivity through things like a better community or ability to understand software better, faster innovation, and also avoiding vendor lock-in, which is very important. Because even if you have open source and closed source uh, solutions, have a technically the same price, they leverage their uh, proprietary vendor, uh, software vendor would have on you is obviously much higher than with uh, 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 open source software, especially truly open source software. What that created is, of course, we got the new uh, generation of open source companies was started, right? A new generation of open source uh, companies came, uh, and these are their really companies which uh, were uh, built as a businesses from the ground up, right? The founders recognize that there is a market opportunity and they can uh, really build a successful company out there and uh, uh, you know make a very good living from that. A lot of those companies are uh, venture funded and they have to provide a high returns and fast no matter the cost. And this is which created the category, which is I am referring as an open source in the quotes, which is about uh, taking the uh, advance, uh, uh, the messaging of open source, which is understood as a very attractive, having a high value, right? Uh, companies uh, those days tend to love uh, open source and would prefer open source to proprietary software, everything being equal. But then also apply the kind of common business principles which you would learn in a business school, right? Hey, how do you build monopoly, avoid commoditization, increase stickiness, build anti-competitive modes, uh, lock in your customers, and so on and so, off, or so forth, right? Many of those would actually conflict with the vision and value of a, mm, a romantic open source. Now, what is interesting is if you look at uh, the uh, classical uh, dilemma between the open source and the proprietary mm, software, you would uh, often have to choose between what you want to optimize for, for maximize the distribution and maximize monetization, right? For example, permissively licensed open source uh, software is really great for maximizing distribution because anybody can use it for uh, any reason inside uh, their property software if you have to and so on and so forth, right? And then copyleft license ha comes with more restrictions, source available licenses even more, and then all the way to a proprietary software which uh, maximizes uh, monetization for a vendor but uh, does not uh, really mm, have the same uh, attributes which, uh, which increase the distribution as open source software has. And I think that is where uh, you uh, see their attempt with us open source in a quotes to see how to get out of this, uh, of this cycle. And I think what you uh, need to consider or think about in the open source software is uh, the governments and related aspects. Now, some open source projects, they would have some so sort of foundation and community which is responsible for steering the upstream uh, project, right? Which is cases are Linux, uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, you know, Drupal, Postgres, right? And, uh, uh, and many others. Now those upstream for communities or foundations, they really offer commercial solutions. So even in those cases, if you are the uh, commercial enterprise, you often end up dealing with vendors which uh, may either have their own distribution, like happens in case of, uh, of Kubernetes or Linux, right? If you uh, are commercial, uh, uh, like a, if you're a big enterprise looking for Linux, you probably would not uh, look at uh, the, trying to run the upstream directly, but you'll work with Red Hat, Suzy, Canonical, right, or others to run their commercial support, uh, su uh, support distributions, right? So that is their, uh, we have a vendor, which I believe for 
most large-scale open source software users, existence plays a very important role, even if uh, software uh, itself has an open source, uh, has an open foundation community-based governance. Okay. So when we talk about uh, the open source uh, with and without quotes, you can think about that as a two big uh, mm, uh, buckets, right? Open source without quotes, that would be open source in substance. And then there is open, a lot of uh, variants of open source in quotes, where open source terms is used for marketing while not really being mm, uh, truly open source. What I would consider as a a truly open source uh, software. Now the open source is not really, you know, trademark term, right? It's more like natural versus organic. There people can uh, have an uh, open source, uh, different things as they choose without actually getting in the, uh, in the legal trouble. But in this case, at the same time, if you really want to have a street, uh, street cred, uh, recording your software of open source, you can uh, 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 comply with one of those three uh, definitions, right? OSI uh, from no, open source uh, uh, definition by open source initiative, uh, GNU software, which uh, talks about the free software, which is uh, I will, uh, uh, I may offend some highliners, but I will use this as an interchangeably with uh, uh, open source software. And also Debian uh, for a very long time had uh, their social contract guidelines, which really uh, desc describe uh, the progress of software which can be included in Debian, which is uh, a very much open source software. If you look at more details and definition, you can see uh, free software defined through those uh, four essential freedoms. And I like it because uh, it's uh, very small. You can actually easy feed it uh, uh, to the slide. If you look at the open source definition, it's much uh, longer more uh, and more detailed, right? So I only put the headlines of uh, that de definition here on the slides and provide you a link about what is uh, uh, that really means. So anyway, if you comply to one of uh, those software definitions, then uh, your software is either open source software or free software. Well, anyway, good stuff. Now let's look at not quite open source software. Now this open, uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, software which often may be uh, referred in a you know marketing literature or somewhere else as an open source, right? Or in a casual conversations, but it does not really provide all of those you know, open source uh, value. So well, here are. Uh, some of the variants of uh, such software. Now, if you look at that, how many variants of the uh, open source uh, uh, software mm, there is uh, exists uh, or uh, the, all the details of the open source governance or licenses, right? You will find what that is pretty complicated and uh, I like to uh, distill that for myself, uh, like or as uh, uh, you know, recommendation to our uh, uh, customers and users is uh, to really, uh, uh, if you, uh, when you are considering some software which may be open source or open source uh, in quotes, right, or one of almost <laughs> or kind of open source software, is to see. Uh, uh, to ask a vendor or maybe yourself uh, the following questions, which really can help you to understand what is your uh, position, really. The first thing is uh, uh, the license, right? Not all open source is created equal, right? Or uh, for, your, mm, uh, for your needs and you need to check if the license fits well for what you are trying to do. Like for example, copyleft licenses may not fit, 
right? Or some of a new generation, uh, uh, the shared source licenses may be quite good if you are uh, building a website, but not uh, work for you if you are trying to build a, a, like a database as a service solution, right? Uh, uh, stuff like that. Another question I would like to ask is about the commercial relationship, right? If you have a commercial relationship with Fender, what happens if you stop that commercial uh, relationship? In many cases, the answer would be, well, you know, you are running our enterprise version of a software or something. Hey, you'll have to uninstall that and so on and so forth. In other cases, you may have uh, your services kind of disconnected from a software and you may say, well, you know what, you can still run our software, but now you're on your own. Or it may be something else, but you better to know uh, what is it. The next question is to understand what are the alternatives to software or as well uh, as to that commercial relationship uh, what you have. In some cases, you have a lot of alternatives. In other cases, you uh, don't have any. So for example, in a database world, I come from the PostgreSQL is, uh, uh, is uh, the best for customer in this case because there are so many companies out there which provide some sort of support and services around Postgres. And so if you don't like one of them, don't like uh, value it provides, you can find a lot, of, uh, a lot of choice. In other cases, you may practically have only, only one vendor, right? Which is, uh, of course, uh, additional risk and uh, probably higher prices. Another thing I think, uh, think is important is to understand can you contribute, right? Because uh, if a vendor is not innovating in a software in a direction you would like, or if a speed would like, do you have a choice of doing uh, that work yourself or hiring somebody to uh, write the, uh, those features for you, right? Or mm, it's, uh, mm, uh, it's not, uh, not possible. Some vendors, for example, are more open than others in accepting contributors, or also their monetization strategy may uh, uh, be something which prevents them to accept you know, some of the features as, as open source. So find it out. Okay, with that, let us move to the open source traps, right? To really uh, the traps of uh, uh, open source in quotes uh, traps. The first one is the most uh, simple one, the open source compatible software. There is a lot of software, and I think especially in the cloud, as a database, as a server, which refers to itself as uh, open source compatible. Yes, we, uh, let's say Amazon Aurora, may uh, refer what it is compatible with open source databases such as MySQL uh, or uh, Postgres. Now, you have to understand what that compatibility means though. In most cases, it uh, is uh, the limited, what I would call the Hotel California compatibility, meaning what uh, it is compatible in a way it uh, is very much focused on having people running open source technology, being able to run on this proprietary technology, not so easy to get uh, out. In fact, uh, most likely all the uh, uh, business uh, is uh, structured around how to make you to use the features which exist out there, which are only available in, in this, open source compatible version, right? But not open source version. So you will uh, be sticky and uh, not leave. Now, what do you want to do to avoid uh, uh, this kind of trap? And look, in many cases, running those open source uh, compatible versions especially in the cloud is a very good practical choice, especially for small teams, right? Because they can really uh, do a lot uh, of stuff for you, right? So you can focus on, uh, on uh, building your application. 
But now, if you want to be sure uh, what you are, uh, have a choice of going back, you want to make sure what you are doing a full testing and validation on both uh, original open source software and, uh, and so-called uh, compatible version. And make sure in this case, it is not just what you are not using this special functionality, but also what uh, uh, performance uh, ma uh, matches your needs and expectations, or you're not relying on some uh, management uh, features, right, which uh, only exist in uh, that property reversion, right? Because I have seen so many people uh, which would say, well, you know what, it's, in general, our application can run on Postgres and also Amazon Aurora Postgres, but you know what? We are very non-comfortable setting up for monitoring, backups, high availability for uh, the uh, open source version. Well, now in this case, uh, uh, that means you can't really uh, run it on original open source and unless you invest more time in figuring it out, your team, your education, and so on and so forth. The open core, that is uh, another uh, the model. What open core means is what there is, exists more or less a crippled open source software version of, uh, of software product and also the real thing, which is uh, available after uh, under proprietary license and uh, uh, right, that is what company tries to sell. At least that is a message you would get from those company sales teams. Now, in the community, you would often hear what the open source version is, uh, you know, is uh, good enough and uh, so on and so forth, right? And in fact, the success of many open source uh, companies really depends a lot of being maintaining that balance. What majority community really loves your open source version and it provides them everything they need while uh, also the uh, you know, uh, enterprises, right, and other players with uh, ability to pay, they value what that real thing uh, provides. Now, what is things to consider in relationship to the uh, open core? One is what innovation is going to be uh, restricted. As a vendor would likely have certain features, sometimes referred as resource features, which we want to be reserved for their property version and which will not be accepted even if contributed uh, by community, right? For example, with MySQL, uh, we at, uh, at Percona provide open source alternatives for a number of features which only available in the proprietary MySQL enterprise version and we would be very happy to contribute them uh, upstream, right? We don't want to maintain more stuff. But of course, Oracle is not interested in that because, well, <laughs> they want uh, uh, people to be mm, uh, seeing the value of their proprietary version, right? Now, what is a very good thing about the open core is what in this case, uh, their community version is typically very uh, well maintained and high, high quality because it serves as a base of the enterprise version, right? So uh, uh, if opens if the community version works well for you, then that is their uh, fantastic choice. The thing you need to understand though is to what extent community version is good enough for you now and in the future needs. In many cases, the future needs are important because, uh, uh, for example, as large company, a large company becomes larger, it may uh, need some additional security, auditing, compliance features, right, and so on and so forth, which are often their, uh, their uh, open core vendors sort of get you, <laughs> uh, right, because uh, those are not available in open source. And also check if there are truly open source alternatives exist for those uh, proprietary uh, features. In certain cases, there are some uh, forks or open source projects where you can actually get uh, this uh, third party alternatives where are open source or even if they are proprietary that reduces the leverage, right? Because if you just have uh, uh, Mm, uh, one vendor 
where you can supply you with a, with a software you need, then you don't have choice, right? You have no choice. If there is a, even one alternative, your situation is much better. The next one is source available licenses. Now, the source available is really very broad uh, class of licenses, which provides uh, the access to view uh, the license of a, uh, of a source code, but um, anything else is up in the air, right? It does not uh, uh, conform to fully the open source software norms and standards, but in what way? It may be, you know, just one little thing or that may be a lot of stuff, right? Like, uh, for example, source available license class, maybe something as a, you know, shared source, which, uh, you know, Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, released some software under uh, uh, like decade or so ago, which provides relatively little value to something as uh, MongoDB SSPL, which while it does not provide uh, you all the value of open source uh, uh, software, it's, uh, if you're not a cloud vendor, it really gives you a lot. Like for example, uh, it still allows uh, Percona to provide Percona server for MongoDB, which is our enhanced and uh, 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 frankly competing uh, uh, solution. Now, what you need to do if you're looking at the shared source license, is make sure to evaluate lay license yourself, like uh, hire a lawyer, right, or read a trusted uh, third party evaluation. Because if you uh, uh, look at the vendor, they're of course motivated to mm, explain what their license is, you know, kind of mm, uh, good for you, right, uh, to maximize adoption of the software, right? And understand uh, uh, the restrictions and conditions where they are okay for you or not, as I mentioned, it will uh, uh, depend, right? And uh, also uh, point out what the intent of many modern shared source licenses is to restrict, uh, restrict competition one way or another. In some cases, it is uh, specifically targeted on the cloud vendors, right? There are a lot of, uh, uh, I would say the uh, open source action <laughs> is uh, happening right now. In other cases, it may be preventing any other commercial vendors to be able to uh, provide you help, uh, support, modify the code, right, whatever. But in uh, both cases, they are kind of focused on creating some sort of uh, advantage uh, for vendor, right, or even monopoly, which will mean uh, a high cost to you uh, compared if that would not exist. Now, a shared source license is a property license and use that as a baseline for your expectations. I think that is a very uh, good uh, uh, rule to follow. Chances are it's not going to be as bad uh, uh, and much better, uh, right? And I also suggest to consider impact on your customers and partners because if you are redistributing uh, shared source uh, license the uh, software where may be impacts uh, downstream, right? Because let's say, uh, for example, SSPL software, well, you can get it on many cloud marketplaces, right? So while you may be able to do stuff uh, yourself, it uh, restricts how usable that software is in the context of uh, partner relationships. And of course, evaluate alternatives what exist, maybe which does not, uh, which are uh, open source and doesn't come with that level of restrictions. Open source uh, eventually. This is class of source uh, available licenses, right? If you be uh, specific, uh, which uh, has an interesting property, what it reverts to fully open source after a period of time. I think the most uh, well-known license uh, of this class is uh, BSL or called like a business source license, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, brought to market by uh, MariaDB Corporation. And since that has been uh, uh, adopted by some other companies such as uh, uh, CockroachDB. In this case, the promise 
is uh, really fantastic saying, hey, you know what? Uh, if you can get it fully open source, isn't that great if it becomes open source in a period of time? Let's say three years. Well, the problem in this case is what uh, the three years or which is a typical time I've seen uh, chosen is a long time in the modern world. And by that time, that source, uh, which uh, software which becomes open source, tends to be um, unsupported and uh, uh, outdated, including what is the most important, the security fixes, which is especially uh, those days is absolutely uh, essential for, uh, for all of us, right? So that means, what by the time an open source, uh, this version gets to open, open source, they uh, pretty much are unsafe to use, right? Now, in theory, you can argue, well, you know what, if a community wants it, they can fork that outdated uh, version, right, and support it, but in uh, uh, practice, it really happens, right? Because why would you do that instead of, you know, focusing on, their you know bleeding edge uh, 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 current stuff, right? So in this case, while opinion and different people uh, people vary, I think for users, the uh, open source eventually, such as VSL license software, actually of a worse value for users compared to the uh, the open core. Their things are sort of much more black and white, and uh, the software you get, the community software, is uh, very fresh, patched, uh, maintained, supported, and so on and so forth. So as if I have a proprietary software, just know what you're getting, uh, getting into, in uh, my opinion. Now, with that, let's cover a couple of other interesting things which uh, uh, can happen in open source uh, software. One thing is uh, a question of uh, availability of uh, the open source software. Let's say this, uh, the open source, just say what the source is available, right? So for example, you have a repository on GitHub or other place, right? Um, but now um, that source, uh, or uh, Mm, uh, doesn't have to be uh, accessible to everyone and the only uh, source what the open source is about. So for example, you may have a source code to be provided only to, uh, only to the customers. Right? In theory, if you give somebody uh, the open source software, they can redistribute that, but customers rarely do. Right, especially if you look at larger customers and they know what the vendor didn't intend them to redistribute stuff, they typically just, you know, give it. Also, the binary distributions may be provided to uh, customers only. But that is another uh, thing you uh, should look uh, 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 should look uh, uh, into, right? Because losing access to the binaries, is, even if the open source is available, that can be um, uh, inconvenient, right? For production, um, production use. So that is another thing I would uh, uh, consider. And also even things like build and test may not be available in open source. That is not requirement. Even some of the most uh, uh, open projects, right, and popular projects, uh, SQLite, which is not even open source, right? It kind of goes beyond that, having uh, the software in the public domain, but the test suite, uh, suite uh, their uh, the kind of the complete one, is uh, not available in the public, right? And that is, uh, really the IP the company uh, company held, right? So mm, uh, you need to understand what those things are uh, in addition and uh, uh, the software which is f considered fully open source and rightfully so uh, 
may have uh, uh, some of uh, those restricted availability, right? So open source license doesn't really mandate the easily availability for, uh, for everyone, especially for builds. And uh, ensure what, what you're getting is uh, enough for your needs. I also wanted to uh, mention another uh, trap or uh, no trap, uh, the model for open source software. It's called Open SaaS, Open Software as a Service, which uh, uh, the model is what open source is available for those who want to do it themselves, run it themselves, but there is also easy to use SaaS solutions for those who want to save time and money, right? Now, in this case, uh, it is uh, great for a lot of software because in a modern world, a lot of software uh, is being consumed in a software as a service model, right? So SaaS is growing very rapidly. The challenge uh, what exists with that is to what extent it is for real. I think many projects uh, advertise themselves and follow in that open SaaS model, whether we use that term directly or not. But in many cases, there are still some components which are being software as a service only and uh, not really available uh, uh, if you are doing you kind of do it yourself employment uh, the development. And that is of course uh, absolutely fine, but just uh, or, uh, you have to understand those components are and what you're relying on if you want to there uh, avoid uh, uh, lock in. With that, I wanted to uh, uh, finish to by uh, inviting you all to their open source database conference we will uh, run uh, in uh, late October. If you're interested in uh, open source database in particular, that is a free online event which you may want to attend. Uh, check it out. And with that, I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you for attending. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, glad about uh, I st stick to time in my recording so we can make up some of the time uh, uh, with a late uh, uh, late finish uh, of the previous talks. And uh, thank you for all the wonderful discussion uh, we had uh, so far. Now to the question which came in the shared notes. I'm not sure who is asking that because well, it doesn't show. But anyway, the question is, uh, have you seen any helicopter open source software projects which nevertheless allow customer independence? And uh, my answer is no, I haven't seen that. And I think it's good to see in what case that helicopter open source is really used, right? Like if you I think the example the most close to me is uh, Oracle doing that uh, with uh, with mysql in a lot of cases they are uh, uh doing that for their business reasons for example they do not uh, want to make uh, things easy for folks like mariadb to cherry pick security fixes for example right or for uh amazon to maintain amazon um, aurora right if you would remove that kind of a business aspect uh, uh, from from that, that's not probably would be a way for them to do it, uh, right? Uh, and in Oracle, that uh, also is connected to another uh, uh, approach is what they take with having a MySQL as open core, not uh, purely open source software. Okay, yeah, so the second question, as I understand about the companies uh, uh, like uh, uh, which are monopolizing open source, uh, right and really dominating over their communities. Well, I mean, uh, in my opinion, right, and again, my experience kind of open source, mostly of open source databases. It was very interesting how to uh, observe those three very different uh, communities, right, in the relationship which you can see in uh, the top uh, open source databases today, like MySQL, PostgreSQL, and and MongoDB. Uh, 
right? With uh, PostgreSQL is uh, is uh, very dynamic, very open, right? You can see what in PostgreSQL space there is uh, no single community which is more powerful than uh, uh, no single company is more powerful than a PostgreSQL community uh, as a whole, right? Uh, and uh, I think uh, with that. It took a long time, but there is a lot of great things going for Postgres those days, right? On the other hand, you can see uh, MySQL, which kind of somewhere in the middle. It uh, grew from uh, really this, you know, Scandinavian open culture, even though it was uh, always commercial company. But then it was at later time acquired by Oracle, but they still kept a lot of, uh, I think that uh, that openness, and they do work with uh, community, even with competitors like like ours, as Kirkona, uh pretty well, right? And then you would have a MongoDB approach, right, which was really uh, very well modeled on the control, control, and control, right? You would see them um, uh, making sure what they would control all the meetups worldwide, right? Be very selective who they invited to one and only MongoDB conference compared to, you know, many hundreds of uh, PostgreSQL conference which happen uh, every year, right? And the fact you can see is what uh, there is really no independent MongoDB community, right, to, to speak about, right? There are some user groups that they are very much uh, 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 focused on, you know, the, uh, on uh, working with uh, their uh, MongoDB company and their approach to business, to market, and so on and so forth. Same as you would see with the proprietary software companies. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, so uh, in this case, like, well, uh, you know, that is a you know big uh, question, right? Which is not something I thought a lot about, right? So I uh, wouldn't comment uh, about that outside of uh, this. I think it's very interesting for me to observe how relationship with open source and cloud uh, happen in US versus some other places in the world, right? Because there in uh, a lot of, uh, in uh, in US, right? You kind of do not uh, think your government preventing your access to those like cloud vendors. But if you go to places like in South America, right? Or in Russia, there is a lot of value put uh, on uh, the open source due to potential independent from some uh, particular, uh, you know, country, right, which can apply uh, apply sanctions to you, right? For me, that was kind of very interesting to see that uh, because, again, this value of open source is not, I think, uh, uh, as valid in the US as in some other countries. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, That's great.